This morning we'll look at Acts chapter 16 verses 25 to 34, the earthquake at Philippi and the jailer's response and question, what must I do to be saved? We'll ask our own question, is faith doing or is faith receiving? Grace, mercy, and peace be yours today from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning we're looking in Acts chapter 16 verses 25 to 34. The question we're asking is faith doing or receiving? Have you ever had one of those days? No matter how we work at it, no matter how much we try to change what's going on, everything just goes wrong. I'm sure you've had those days. I've had those days more than we can count. It's amazing as we do that, that no matter what's going on in your life, you just can't seem to change the day. It's a little bit like the paratrooper who on his first jump was given these instructions. Jump out of the airplane, shout airborne. Count to three and your chute will open. If the chute doesn't open, take the reserve cord and rip it out and that chute will open for you. And then when you get down to the ground, there'll be a truck waiting to take you back to base. And so, the young paratrooper, over the drop zone, gets a signal, jumps out of the plane, shouts, airborne. One, two, three, and looks up. But the chute doesn't open. So, he grabs the cord and rips it, and that chute won't open. He looks down below at the landing zone and he says, oh good, the way my day's going, the truck won't be there either. <laughs> You've probably heard that before or a variation on it. Some days are just like that, aren't they? Everything seems to be going good and then bang, it's just all wrong. In Acts chapter 16 today, Paul has been having a great mission trip. He and Barnabas parted their ways. Barnabas uh, took Mark and he went to Cyrus. Paul took Silas as his companion, his assistant. And he began going through Syria and, and on through um, the other areas, re restoring the churches that he had planted, encouraging them, building them up in the word and moving on. And he was ready to go into Bithynia. But God closed the door. He had a dream, he had a vision. There was a man in Macedonia, the far northern part of Israel, is Italy, actually the, kind of the doorway into Europe there, waving at him, come over here, you know. So he wakes up in the morning, they go down to Troas, take a ship over to Macedonia, and as he goes into Macedonia, he stops at Philippi. Well, he has... On a, on a Sabbath day, gone to the river to pray with those Jews who meet there. and He meets Lydia, seller in purple, a woman with a very kind heart. She comes to faith in Jesus. Wonderful. He's walking through the town of Philippi. There's a young lady following him, shouting out behind him, These men are telling you about how to be saved. They're teaching you about the Most High God. But hour after hour, it gets irritating. Paul turns and he looks at her and he casts out the demon within her. This lady had a young, this young lady had a troubled heart. I wonder what it felt like after years and years of possession to suddenly be free. I'm sure she was overjoyed that Christ had come into her life. But she was a slave, and as you may well know, her owners, who made plenty of money off her ability to tell the future, were not pleased. Suddenly, this lucrative income dried up, and they were angry. Things seemed to suddenly turn around for Paul and Silas at that time, because these men grabbed them. And they took him down to the marketplace where they, they sat in judgment in front of the magistrates, didn't get a trial. 
These men didn't even tell them the truth about what was going on. They just said, these men are stirring up the crowd and telling us Romans to practice things that are unlawful for us to do. Now, Philippi was a town that marked a major Roman battle in its civil war between the Republic and the Empire. And Augustus had planted retired military men there. It was a true Roman colony. And you can imagine how quickly these retired Roman soldiers got all worked up that these two men who were Jews were telling us to break Roman law and they all got involved. And so the magistrates, without any trial, stripped Paul and, and Silas and had them beaten severely with canes. And when they were beaten and bloody, they gave them to the jailer and told them not only to put him, put him in prison, but to hold him securely in the inner rooms. And so he chained them to the walls. Now, when our days go badly, at least my days go badly, sometimes I might get frustrated. Sometimes, if it won't turn around, I might even get so frustrated I become angry. Or there's always this, this favorite thing that we can go to in our human nature. Poor me. And I sulk. And maybe we might expect Paul and Silas to do that very thing. But as we look into our lesson today, beginning at verse 25, it tells us there that they were singing. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Here are these two men, everything going south, and they're sitting there singing hymns to God, celebrating what God is doing in their lives and the ministry and the power of God's word. And they've got the attention of the other prisoners. Now this is a prison. It's just not like a holding cell we might have today or the drunk tank, you know. This is where serious criminals were put. And these hardened men were listening to them praying and singing. And you know what else? The jailer was hearing them praying and singing. Now, a jailer in a prison like that might expect cursing and swearing and, and threats and all sorts of nasty things. But here are these men of God celebrating despite their situation. That just goes against human nature. Not only that, but this man lived based on what we read here, above the prison. He and his family were like the warden, right? And he lived right there on the complex. He might very well have not only heard them in the jailhouse, but he might have heard their singing upstairs while he and his family went to sleep. And then suddenly something happened. Suddenly, in the next verse, we're told there was a violent earthquake that the foundations, the, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, at once all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. A typical jailhouse in that region might very well have been made from stones from the neighboring hillsides. And with that, the, the iron bars would have popped open and the chains which would have been bolted to the wall would have fallen off if those stones were moving and suddenly everyone was free. And the jailer, of course, with that violent earthquake, would have come right awake and ran down to the jailhouse. And you know what he saw, it says in the scripture, it says that he found all of the doors to the prison ajar. He drew his sword. He was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. A Roman jailer in a Roman city under Roman law was required to suffer the punishment of those prisoners who escaped his watch. 
Some of them were probably destined to slavery in the, galley, in the galleys on the, on the ocean. Others perhaps to the stone quarries. Others to death. What was he going to do? He would have had to have a choice of those three, very likely. So what did he do? He took his dagger. And he was about to thrust it into himself because it was a more honorable way to die. He was terrified. He came face to face with death. And then something happened. Something that suddenly turned his life completely around. Paul cried out from within the prison, Don't kill yourself. We are all here. Not one prisoner had gotten up and left. Why? It doesn't really tell us, but we might presume they were all listening to Paul and Silas throughout the night. And maybe something had happened in their hearts as the word of God worked on them. Not a one of them ran away. And the guard ordered his men to bring lights and he went into the middle of the prison where Paul and Silas were being held in the most secure location and he fell down on his knees shaking. There were, if you're counting them, two earthquakes that night. The first one was a violent one that threw him out of bed, that shook the foundations of the jail and burst the doors open. The second one was an earthquake within his conscience that shook the very foundation of his soul and burst the doors of his heart open. Now in the next sentence, we get an insight into what's going on into this man's soul. It says, <clears throat> He then, the jailer, brought Paul and Silas out and asked them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? It's a very human question. What must I do to be saved? They were living witnesses of the joy that they had in Christ. He had heard that witness. He had come face to face with death. He was not ready to go to his maker for judgment. Even as he pulled his sword. What must I do to be saved? Now here's where we ask our question. Is faith doing? Or is faith receiving? And the answer that Paul gives is very telling here. Very telling. Because it gives us exactly how the early church understood all of this issue with the word of God that we wrestle with daily. Paul and Silas replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Paul does not answer, what must you do? There is no works that he must do. There is no special prayers that he must say. It's just simply, believe. Just believe it. And that itself is not even a work, is it? What is it if it's not a work? Don't we do faith? When we are in the trials of tribulation and temptation, when our day is going down the tubes, don't we look to our faith? Don't we call out faith as something resilient within us and by the force of our will, trust and turn things around? No. Not at all. Because you see, faith it's not a work. It's not doing. What Paul says here is that faith is receiving. Faith 
is like a vessel that God places in our heart by his love for us and his working through the word and sacrament as we see in the text and there that wonderful vessel receives all the blessings that God wants to give us. And so when we have a bad day, when we're wrestling with temptation, when everything's beating us down, we don't look to something within us that we do. We look to God who gives it. That's a very different thing, isn't it? Human nature wants to earn its way into heaven, wants to justify itself by God. And I'm sure if any of us were standing before a worldly judge and we laid out all of our sins, everything we thought, said, done, the secret places of our heart, and he looked at all of us, that judge would probably say, well, I'm going to order you from the worst sinner to the better sinner. But when we stand before the judge of heaven and earth, there is no worse sinner or better sinner. There is only sinner. And the punishment for sin is not simply death, physical death. It's eternal torment prepared for Satan and his demons in hell. And that can be very frightening. So, God in his love has sent Christ. And Christ, these messengers of Jesus, are praying and singing about the love of God that we don't deserve. He loves us anyway, who gives us this wonderful gift that we might receive all that he would give to us because faith isn't doing, it's receiving. And what are we receiving? We're receiving a wage that we have not earned, but someone has earned for us. And that person is Christ Jesus on the cross who takes away the sin of the world and who's come to you in his love and placed that gift in your heart and made you, God made you his child. And when he did that and you received his love, all of your sins, and let's face it, our sins are horrible, and many were washed away. And you stand in the presence of God in perfect holiness and righteousness. Not who you are, but wearing, right, the robe of Christ's righteousness. And God sees you and he sees Jesus and he declares before the world not guilty. You are not guilty of your sins. And the heart that believes rejoices. And what did that jailer do that night when he heard the word of promise and hope from Paul and Silas? He took them upstairs to his home and he washed their wounds, washed the dried blood off of them clothed them properly, set a meal before them. He and his family, in fact it says his household even, his slaves, his servants, his children, his wife, everybody that lived and worked there heard Paul and Silas and the wonderful good news of Jesus. And then, like the Ethiopian eunuch, nothing was preventing them. They immediately were baptized and it says in the text that because of the word that they heard and believed and because of the gift of baptism that had turned their life around which was a bad go which was going downhill is now being blessed by God excuse me it says <laughs> that they were filled with joy not happiness not happiness they were filled with divine joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. There is nothing more wonderful than being of one heart and one faith and one mind, you and your wife and your children. And in this world that's broken and trials and tribulations come, that's not always possible. But there is a greater church there is the invisible church of all who believe in Christ, and that is something to rejoice in. 
whether you're Macedonian or whether you're Syrian or whether you're even American. For Christ has died for your sins and mine. He has, through faith, made you part of his family. Through the water and the word, you have been gathered together. And because of that, you will never die. You will never die. You stand before God pure and blameless. And God's love for you will bring you at the right moment to be with him in heaven. Wow. Remarkable. Exciting. And now the question that I want to ask you, now that you know faith is receiving and not doing, has God made you a Paul and Silas in your life? Is there someone in your life that you might, with God's direction, touch with the message of salvation so that God, not you, but God can work in their life through water and the word? Maybe there is. Think about it. And then, and then rejoice. Because God wants to use you to be a light of his love in a world of darkness. What a privilege. What a privilege he has given us in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. We stand for blessing. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'd like to hear more on this topic or any other, please contact us or join us Sunday mornings for worship at 9 o'clock, Bible class at 10 30.